Yeah, you know, we, we just want to talk a little bit today about your brother, you know, obviously um, a huge public figure of the last, you know, few decades. Um, yeah. You know, let's kind of just start a little bit, you know, as kids. Tell me what it was like, you know, uh, growing up with him. Uh, you know, in, in a real way, I didn't grow up with my brother. I mean, we were in the house together, but he was uh, almost 10 years older than me. So by the time I came around, he was out on the street, you know, uh, and in Brooklyn in those days, you were literally on the street. So m maybe, maybe a little later than 10, but, uh, and he was a rough kid and he, he had, I have another brother who is seven years older than me. And so the two of them kind of palled around together and now we were in the house and we fought regularly and, uh, it became very apparent to me, especially in my teens, that we were very different people. Uh, our interests were very different. Of course, he had a whole network of friends. Maybe I would have turned out differently had we been similar in age. But I remember going to my mother once and saying, uh, you can tell me, am I adopted? Because <laughs> I thought, you know, it just uh, was so different. I was interested in books and religion and things like that. And he was out on the street scrapping with people and got himself in a lot of trouble over the years. But then eventually we turned around. Yeah, absolutely. So, I have to say that I always knew his affection and love uh, for our family and for me. Yeah, you know, obviously even as a kid out and, you know, riding around on the street, you, you could at least, you know, he still, you know, kept his family close. Oh, very much so. And um, I had a great love for my father and, and my mother. Um, and... It, it didn't hurt to have a brother like that when the bullies at the school would pick on you because he'd take care of it like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Um, so, you know, going forward, I know, uh, uh, you know, before he got into the, um, you know, the, the acting and Hollywood and all that, um, he, he got himself into a little bit of, like you mentioned, a little bit of legal trouble. He, he did, uh, quite a bit. Uh, I, I can't say that I was aware of it at all times. Uh, although I did uh, go to the court for the sentencing, I remember doing that, and I even went to Sing Sing to visit him when he was in jail at one point. Um, I didn't know all of the details that it was un unfurling. I do know this, and just to clear up some of the rumors and stuff, he was not a made man. Uh, he was close to a lot of that stuff, but and, and I know also that he never killed anybody. <laughs> he, you know... That those are the rumors that, that, that our family was somehow associated with crime families. It just wasn't true. Uh, he was all, around a lot of it, uh, as most Italian-Americans of that era would have been. Um, and then as a kid, I was protected from a lot of the, the details of what was going on. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, you know uh, obviously around the, the, these families and, and things, but not, you know, not a make you know, right. not, not Certainly actually. not at the top. Yeah, no, but not not like you know, <clears throat> you know, right hand man or any of that kind no. of stuff. No, no. Okay. not at all. He was yeah, pretty, pretty low level. Yeah. So, um, when did you become aware of you know his his desire to get into acting at all? Uh, shortly after he came out of prison, uh, I heard about that, and. Um, if I remember the chronology right, I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I was in college at the University of Southern California. And he came out there for a while because his acting teacher was there who's a, an actor in his own right whose name slips me. And I remember spending an afternoon in the backyard while they were talking and stuff um, and went to some Hollywood parties that were there. It was really fun to meet these. It's a whole different kind of social environment that I, I would be used to. Um, and so I saw him beginning to, to try and get into it. And then we would hear about a commercial or a, a, a piece on Starsky and Hutch. Or, then there was a film that came out called Fingers, which I have to say was a horrible film in my estimation, where he plays some kind of thug again who gets killed and shot in the in the head uh, at the end of the movie. I remember I saw that late at night on the, in the theater in Hollywood with uh, two or three other people in the theater, including a woman with a baby. 
I don't know why she was watching this movie in the middle of the night, but he had asked me to go and see it, and uh, I called him and I said, I, I did see it. He said, what do you think? I said, well, you, you look like you <laughs> till the end. <laughs> Yeah. So, but then it, it began to build very slowly, and um, that whole world, you know, you never know whether you're going to be successful or not, and the vast majority of the actors are working in other fields, and for a time he worked in construction and different things like that, um, but he had very clearly broken with his past, and he had a new direction, but he wanted to use what he had experienced professionally, which he ended up doing quite phenomenally. Um, and, um, and then I remember when The Sopranos came around, and by this time he had been a Starsky and Hutch, and... Um, uh, Goodfellas. Uh, well, Goodfellas a little later. I remember seeing Goodfellas when I was here in Grand Rapids. Uh -huh. uh, and I walked out of that movie theater with a friend, in fact, the co-founder of the Acton Institute, who's a you know, a Seattle boy, you know, and he looked, he said, what did you think of that? I said, I found it very uncomfortable. He said, why? I said, because it was too familiar. You know, just the whole environment. I mean, the the parties they had in there felt like parties I had been to, family parties and that kind of thing. Um, but when The Sopranos came around and he told me, he said, I'm going to be in this HBO, which was relatively new. I didn't watch HBO a lot. Um, he said, it's called The Sopranos. I said, it's a singing uh, thing. He said, no, no, it's, <laughs> you wouldn't understand. So, uh, and then when I saw the uh, first episode, and then he said it had been uh, bought, uh, he said, we got to go at least five episodes. If we go five episodes, I'm set. And it did, it went six. And his significance to that series and then to the industry as a whole only slowly emerged. You know, it wasn't like one day he wasn't and the next day he was. He didn't win the, win the lottery. It was a, a more gradual um, emergence. And then at the funeral, I mean, and the responses to, to his death really confirmed his place really in, in film history. Yeah, um, you know, that's that's one thing I wanted to ask about was, you know, over this last week, um, what's it been like to see, you know, just the outpouring of support from people all over the world, you know, that mm -hmm. have been, you know, fans of your brother now for uh, decades. show came out in the 90s, started in the 90s. There's a whole new generation that's just discovering him because of streaming services. So, um, and, uh, I, you know, the thing that strikes me, of course, it's been overwhelming just to deal with the death of a loved one and then to have to deal with the details of a funeral and a burial, which I, I did with my, my niece and his son, um, but then to have the attention of so many fans. And I have to say, in the things I've read and the tributes I've read, when, when the New York Times obituary came out and I saw the length of it, I was astounded because I, I know the media and you know New York Times you get a paragraph he has a very long obituary and generally accurate <laughs> there's, there's some inaccuracies here but the thing that strikes me is that there I have not seen a single negative thing about him in all of the comments on all of the blogs and the websites and my own uh, Facebook posting has over 3,000 uh, you know comments and likes and stuff like that and then the emails people have been very kind and I know well enough the public that people get snarky especially online when they're invisible and I just haven't seen it yeah um, you know growing up uh, obviously uh, him and, and family and, and you know seeing him out and, and doing these things maybe getting in trouble that kind of stuff I, I have to imagine you probably never thought he had the impact on so many people as, as he has now. Yeah, th there was something <laughs> my mother used to say about um, why the bread in Brooklyn is so good. She, she would always say, it's, it's the water. There was something in the water, uh, by which I mean, of course, the culture and in our home. I mean, in, in a way, my brother and I took 
similar kind of trajectory, very different, you know, goals and stuff, but the back and forth and then coming later in life to really discover your vocation. Um, it, it's very rewarding to see it and overwhelming, you know, I, it hasn't fully settled yet in my own mind because I'm still tired from the, the physical demands that I was under this last week. Um, what is very important for me and what became apparent to me at the wake, the wake was closed and it was just for our family and then the, a lot of the colleagues that he had worked with. And um, uh, Lorraine Bracco and Michael Imperioli and um, uh, uh, Stevie Van Zandt gave uh, eulogies at the wake. And as I listened to the eulogies, the, what became very apparent to me through their eyes was, was what I saw theologically as a priest, namely a guy who has um, a hard exterior and a soft interior. I likened it to a, a loaf of Italian bread. Uh, and I think that soft interior is what made it possible for him at the end to go to confession and to receive absolution, which for me as a priest was the most important thing, not the fame and the money and all of that. Um, and he did. Just a few weeks ago, I heard his confession and absolved him. So I felt that the whole Mass that we celebrated had such integrity. That's, uh, that's, that's very cool. I can yeah. only imagine, you know, especially yeah. <laughs> for you. you know, that's it was a great be... comfort to his family, you know. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Um, so... Uh, when it comes to you know his character in the show, um, how far off, how, how much was he really acting, and how much was that really just uh, you know Tony? No, uh, uh, the characteristics were him certainly. Uh, I, I I said uh, let's put it this way, we I called him Junior because uh, that was our name growing up. He said, "Don't call me that in public." <laughs> uh, I said, "Let's put it this way, Junior." You're never going to do Shakespeare in the park. Well, then I just heard that they actually did a Shakespeare. Uh, so I have to go and see this uh, Sopranos-type Shakespeare. But um, David Chase, who is the creator of uh, The Sopranos, I think one of the reasons it was such a successful series in general is that he is a keen observer of traits and personalities and would incorporate aspects of people's lives and then change them around a little bit. And I think there were things that I recognized that people wouldn't know if they didn't know my brother that were parts of his life and certainly his quirks, his fastidiousness, his, um, uh, he was a bit of a hypochondriac and, and that comes out in the thing and he was a bit superstitious. I mean, you know, for a hard guy, he was, he was religious. Uh, and his old school, he was very old school, and um, I guess I am too, you know, in, in that regard, just the way we were raised. I'll tell you a little secret that, that I haven't, I've told friends this, but I've never discussed it publicly. I was on the set a few times of uh, The Sopranos, and I got to know David Chase and a number of the other people. Um, David Chase called and asked me, well, first of all, he asked some advice on some scripts, about religious, the, certain religious things. But then he called and asked me to be on The Sopranos. Um, there was a role for priest, not, not the priest, uh, whose part I didn't appreciate, uh, but a priest, uh, kind of walk on parts. He, and he, he joked, he said, we'll save on wardrobe with you. So um, I, I talked to, to some friends about it, and I, I decided to decline it because I, I said, you know, there's one Sirico actor in the family, there don't need to be two. At my mother's wake, a lot of them came, including uh, James Gandolfini. And uh, it was at the time that Gandolfini had held up the production of The Sopranos, if you know the whole history of that, because he, he was demanding more money. And not just for himself, he ended up uh, giving large bonuses to, to his colleagues. Um, and Gandolfini came up to me and said, um, 
I heard David offered you a part on The Sopranos. And I said, yeah. He said, you turned him down? I said, yeah. He said, why? I said, because he wasn't offering enough. <laughs> and he said, oh, you got my manager. <laughs> so uh, it was a, a fun thing. So my conclusion to that is that uh, even though people were wrapped around the block to get a walk-on part on The Sopranos, I have a more distinctive note, footnote in my history, is that I turned down a part of The Sopranos. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, you know, you mentioned this, this fastidiousness and the, and the, um, the hypochondria. Uh, those definitely do come out during the show. i got to ask, uh, you know, the big thing in the show for him was also his hair. Uh, yeah. Was that something in, in real life that he was like, i got to take care of the hair? Oh, well, he was always very fastidious with his hair and everything. Of course, the, the, the temples, I mean, that was natural to him, the, the, the wings. Uh, and he wore them after, he because that was a signature. So when we'd walk through an airport, it was pandemonium, especially in New York. Uh, but um, he was very fastidious in the way he dressed if he would come to the to the house and with his cologne. There was always a thing with cologne. He'd spray himself so that if you hug him, you'd smell of it a half hour later, that kind of thing. Uh, so no, that, that was pretty much him. That was just him in a nutshell. And a lot of these uh, hand gestures were, were very much him. And the bada boom, bada bing. I mean, I heard that growing up. So I don't think he invented it. I think it was just part of the culture. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, so, you know, just kind of in closing, you know, when when was the last time that you, you spoke with him before he passed? So this would have been about, um, about three or four weeks ago. Um, and that's when I invited him to go to confession and he did and did you um like at that time kind of know that his health yeah was declining? that's why i did that i could see that his health was declining uh, we didn't want people to know about that i, I mean uh, i remember the, the very dignified way in which president reagan removed himself from the public um and we just thought that was time for him to do that and he never lost his dignity he never lost his sense of humor he never lost his strength. Um, sometimes he wouldn't remember certain things. Um, he never forgot his daughter or his son uh, or me. So it sounds like throughout his life, he was just a big family man. Oh, absolutely. Even, even when he made mistakes in, a, in his own family life. All of that came full circle now. Yeah. And so that, like we mentioned, has to feel really good for you and for you and the rest of your family to see. Yeah, that. no, and especially for his kids. I mean, I spent, I know them, you know, but I spent an intense period of time with them now this last. In fact, my niece happened to be here one week before the burial. She was visiting, and um, we were talking about him and, you know, funeral uh, preparations and stuff. And, and so we had a, a lot of time together, and, and I think if they were talking to you now, they would talk about the full circle. It, it all came back, and we feel so blessed by that because so many people don't have that. They have an abrupt break or something happens or it's you know, something not prepared for. Uh, this really worked out providentially very well. That's great. That's great. I, I hope I have as happy a death. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that most people would, would want that for sure, and that's really great, yeah. you know, not only for him, but for you guys too, mm -hmm. to know that he had that. So, um, you know, is, is there anything uh, that maybe I didn't ask you about here that, you know, you want to mention? I think we touched on, you know, a lot of great stuff. He, he made some friends in Grand Rapids. Okay. Uh, I remember there was, uh, I won't mention names of, of the business people, but <clears throat> when he was coming for the 20th anniversary of the Acton Institute, he... Um, some friends said, do you think we could have just a private reception with him? You know, and I, I said, well, let me ask him. And uh, I did. And he said, sure, you, you know these people. Should I do it? I said, it, it would really be nice. These are good people. They've been generous supporters of our work. And I would love to meet you. So he said, fine. Uh, and as an aside, there was um, a staffer at Acton at the time who had a brother who had um, had a, an accident and was... Um, I guess paraplegic, um, and uh, he said 
he's just been a fan of the Sopranos. Do you think he could meet him? I said, well, let me see if I can coordinate things because I have a place. He's going to go to a reception with some people and maybe he could just be incorporated into that. And so I, and that's what happened. And he was there in the wheelchair and all of these, if I mention the names of the Grand Rapid elite who were there, they were all there and they were very anxious to meet him. They had great wine. My brother drank god-awful wine all of his life until that night and he discovered good wine that night and um, he went around the moon room and met everybody and they're taking pictures and then he saw this kid in a wheelchair and he said and and what i'm telling you now can be repeated over and over and over again in various circumstances with wounded warriors and saint jude's hospital but i saw it and they all saw it he sat down with that kid and talked with him the rest of the night, ignored all of these people in the room. And the, the guy who hosted it said, your brother is a class act. So uh, that's a very fond memory. And, and, and in a way, it, it epitomized the kind of soft interior that I talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, you know, coming full circle from where, yeah. you know, yeah. as a kid and then, you know, trouble in the middle of his life too, you know. <laughs> he wanted to use his celebrity on a very personal basis. He 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 really wanted, you know. Um, we we came from a poor home, and his success was not something he took for granted, and wanted to use that and show his appreciation for it by the way he treated people. Absolutely. So. Um you know, anything in closing that, you know, uh, obviously I know you got to talk to him a few weeks ago, but, you know, if you had one more chance to say something to him, you know, what would you want to say? I, you know, I really think I said all that I needed to. We, we loved each other. Um, we had a, a mutual admiration society. I was so proud of his success and he was so proud of mine. He was a donor to the Acton Institute uh, and he... He really um, uh, enjoyed his visits here.